And finally, but not least of all, best of all, the harvesters are putting on a Christmas lunch. If you went to it last year, it's super fun. The teens serve and there's entertainment. It's great food. It's beautiful. Like, it's the whole thing. So you have to come. Sign-ups are at the ministry hub. <clears throat> And it's $15, great food. You'll see all the details out there. And if you're interested in decorating a table, it's a cool opportunity. They have an example out there. It's really fun. So you don't want to miss this. It's December 15th, so make sure you sign up. You, it's going to be so much fun. So please sign up for that. And Gary's up. Good morning, East Sunshine family. It's so good to see everybody out on this kind of rainy, gloomy day. It's such a joy to have everyone here to worship God. I was reading just a few days ago in Psalms, David says, Oh, the joys of those who are kind to the poor. So that season of the men's sheltering has already started, actually December 1st. You probably see the slide behind me. And here in a few minutes, I want to be praying for all those, those people that have, had, have spent their time and sacrifice and wanting to uh, volunteer uh, in such a awesome uh, worship for us. To, uh, so I want to make sure in a few minutes, I want to pray for all those people that are willing to do that. As we as a, a nation start to come together, we know of the upcoming election that's about to happen. And we and the elders encourage everyone to dedicate your prayers to the pursuit of unity. Let us come together in faith and spirit, lifting our voices in peace and harmony and the unconditional love, love for the world, love for the church, and love for everyone around us. In addition to this, the church will be open tomorrow between 7 a.m. and 4 p.m. for anyone who would wish to come and pray individually or as a group. May our prayers bring us closer, strengthen our bonds, and be a light to those in our nation. Let's pray. Good morning, Father. We thank you as we prepare for the national election. As we ask for your guidance and wisdom during this time. May your love and grace fill our hearts. And may we be instruments of peace. Unite us in our shared faith and purpose. And help us to be a beacon of hope and love in our communities. We ask also for your blessing upon those who serve in the homeless shelter this coming year. Grant them strength in their dedication, warmth in their hearts, and resilience in their spirit. May they find joy in their service and their smiles. May they be a hope for all the men who will be here this year. Let their efforts be a light to all those that are in need. Dear Father, you are worthy of our praise. We come here today to lift your name high above all else. Let your presence fill this space. And may our worship rise like a fragrant offering to you. Guide us to worship you in spirit and truth with all our hearts, minds, and souls. We seek to honor you with every breath this morning. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Good morning, church family. I'm Debbie Barnes, and I'm going to be reading from Colossians 3 this morning. God has chosen you and made you his holy people. He loves you. So you should always close yourself with mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive each other. Even more than all this, clothe yourself in love. Love is what holds you all together in perfect unity. Let the peace that Christ gives control your thinking. 
because you were called together in one body to have peace. Always be thankful. Let the teaching of Christ live in you richly. Use all wisdom to teach and instruct each other by singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. Everything you do or say should be done to obey Jesus your Lord, and in all you do, give thanks to God the Father through Jesus. If you're visiting with us this morning, this is the time when we come together to share communion. And if you have not received the elements for communion, please raise your hand and someone will bring that to you at this point in time. In the passage Debbie read to us from Colossians, Paul does what he does in virtually all of his letters. The first half of the letter is basically theology. And then the second half of the letter is practical advice. And in the section that Debbie read to us a moment ago, Paul lists a bunch of things he thinks Christians should be doing with their lives, bearing each other's burdens, helping, forgiving. And then there's almost as if Paul takes a deep breath. There's a period there. After all he said that we should be doing, he takes a deep breath period, and says, and be thankful. It just stands out. And be thankful. For a Christian, being thankful is not something we do in November on Thanksgiving. It's something that dominates our life. And be thankful. Okay. Here's the generation gap this morning. My generation used to sing a song all the time. Beautiful prose. And here's the prose. When upon life's billows, you are tempest tossed. When you are discouraged, thinking all is lost. Are you ever burdened? with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy that you are called to bear? So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged. God is over all. And after each of those verses, the refrain goes, count your blessings. Name them. Name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Now, as a kid, I sang that almost every Sunday. If you're my age, it seems like we sang that every Sunday. But as I got older, and I reflect on those words, that's the heart, isn't it? And be thankful. This morning, we're going to do a little different as we do each first Sunday of the month. We're going to ask you to break up into groups, find somebody close to you and sit with them. And if that's not convenient for you, sit and reflect in your own heart and think about these things today. Thankful. What makes you thankful? When are you not thankful? You can come up with your own things here, but be thankful. What causes you to be thankful? How can you be more thankful? Is thankfulness a part of your life? Should it be? So for a few minutes here, get close to someone and spend a few moments with them thinking about this concept, this idea, that as Christians, this should be the core of our life. Be thankful. As we come to the core of our time 
this morning. In many Christian groups, this moment is called the Eucharist. Eucharist is a Greek word. It's a very simple Greek word. It means thanks. It's analogous to our English word, thanks. Just think of all the ways that we use the word thanks and the meanings that it have when we say it. We walk out of the grocery store, pay our bill, and we say to the clerk, thanks. Somebody gives us a gift, very nice gift. We say, thanks. You have a life-threatening condition and someone has given you a bone marrow transfer, transfer, no, transplant and you speak to them and you say, thanks. The word thanks can mean so many different things from a very trivial thanks to, oh God, how can I ever thank you? We are now prepared to give thanks to God for his immeasurable gift. In a moment, how will you say that word thanks in your heart? Thanks, God. Or God, thank you. I'm going to pray this morning for our thanks to God and how you are saying in your heart right now, God, thank you for this immeasurable gift. Words fail us, Father. There are times when we do not have any word in our human to existence to express what is on our heart. And that mor this morning, Father, that word is thank you. You gave your son he gave his life for us. God, thank you for his gift that we are remembering this morning in this bread and in this juice that represent his body and the blood he shed on the cross for us. In his holy name we pray, amen. His body broken for you. His blood shed on the cross. During this song, the children in praise and play are excused. May God bless our service and time together. You know what? Uh, thank you so much to Gary Brock uh, for setting, and even Debbie Barnes, for setting the tone on gratitude being the foundation that we stand upon because of Jesus. Today, our home church uh, that we were at for the past 10 years, we woke up to a million messages that a church in Tulsa did not have power today. So can we all praise God of this building that we get to gather in? Thank God for it. Let's, let's give, give God praise. That's something to be thankful for. We forget to thank God for AC and power. And uh, I'm also thankful for a conversation I had with Rob Fridge today about Karen Mizell and her team of workers for the cold uh, weather shelter for our men, our outdoorsmen that are looking for a place to stay that starts this month through February. Um, found out that Rob has interacted and is studying the gospel with someone that was here years ago in that men's shelter, and now they're in our fellowship, and they're seeking to know about Jesus. That, you never know what seeds we're planting, so please, if you have not gone over to Karen Mizell and said, how can I help? Believe me, there are eternal fruit uh, things coming for the kingdom of God. So Karen, can you, uh, we're thankful for Karen Mizell. If you're thankful, thank you so much.
I am uh, personally thankful for the fifth weekend in a row we have Oklahoma visitors with us. We have two Harding students that are sitting with my wife today. Uh, it's funny because the message today is on forgiveness, and uh, I, I was talking smack at them as I beat them at different board games, and they're still my friend today, so I have gratitude for Hunter and Melody, my friends from Harding. I'm also thankful for Bruce and Margaret. Um, this is the Deaton family. Bruce leads the women's evangel soccer team. I'm thankful for Greg and Melissa Bukovats who uh, sent all of us to gather at that field yesterday, except we are all chickens because a little rain causes us to scatter and run to our cars. And Greg and Melissa stood strong with the Deaton family and watched Evangel come to victory yesterday. But thankful just for the opportunity for fellowship, for service. That's, that's an amazing opportunity to bring our community and church together. That Springfield and East Sunshine, we could be one because of what Jesus has done. So keep presenting us those opportunities. Get us into your workplaces and schools. God is good. I'm thankful. Um, now let's start with maybe as a teenager what I wasn't thankful for. Things I wasn't allowed to do in church growing up. What would your list be? Things you weren't allowed to do. For me, my list was you better not wear shorts ever Sunday morning or pretty much ever in general. Uh, I think we've come so far with that, right? Uh, you were not allowed to joke during the sermon with your friends. I'm, I don't know why I looked at the teens. I, that, they, they were always looking at the teens and uh, it was funny. Not only could moms and dads be nearby to flick your ear if you were talking, but they even gave license to other church members. Flick my kid's ear if you see them talking. Man, oh, I love that. Uh, We don't have trauma from that, do we? Uh, Another thing I wasn't allowed to do in church growing up was listen to rap music on the church bus. And then I think we started getting Lecrae and other Christian rappers, and we've grown in that area. But let me show you the one thing, the number one rule at youth group lock-ins that I was not allowed to do, and this video will illustrate what that is. So that number one rule was don't play in the baptistry because that is holy grounds, right? Did we get in the baptistry? We're going to have to answer to God one day about that, I guess. Um, so as, as offensive growing up as some of those things, wearing shorts in church and messing around at the baptistry, you know, there's something more offensive to God when it comes to us gathering together as a body, and that would be a lack of forgiveness, an unwillingness to forgive our brothers and sisters when they've hurt us. Uh, it, it'd be like this. Think about me being up here, and I'm not a smoker, never have been, but just picture me getting a pack of cigarettes. I thought about doing this, but that's offensive. You can't do that in church. So you, you get that cigarette out of the box, and then I light it in front of you guys, and then I, I smoke it right in front of you. And you'd be like, how could you even think about doing that? And I'd be like, well, I I feel like it. And you would say, it doesn't matter if you feel like it. You are bringing cancer to yourself. You're bringing secondhand cancer to us who breathe in your smoke. And as toxic as that is for the human body and for the lungs, more toxic to our soul is us walking around with that poison that bitters our heart called unforgiveness. And so we need to forget, not forget this, when we leave here, the church building, even though we have lights and electricity today, we need to understand that when we leave here, we are the church. So when you walk around and go to your, church, uh, your workplaces and schools and your community, you need to understand you're a walking billboard. for our amb- We are ambassadors of the king. And when people know us in Springfield for being unwilling to forgive, That is what is the most toxic thing Jesus will teach us about today. The most toxic thing for your soul. Jesus would even say, those of you who came to worship today, listen to this, what Jesus said. He said, if you are offering your gift at the altar to God and remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift at that altar, stop singing, 
stop listening to the sermon. He's basically like, first, go and be reconciled to the person you have a problem with or they have a problem with you, and then come offer your gift. There's something about God that he doesn't even really want our vertical worship until we horizontally reconcile. Paul, in the, in the verse Debbie read today, said our clothes that you walk into church, it doesn't matter if you wear shorts or a nice suit. He says, Paul, in Colossians 3, you're supposed to be clothing yourself with forgiveness. That is literally the clothes Christians are known for. Are known for. If we have been forgiven, you better be clothing yourself, Jesus says, with forgiveness. So I got to tell you, I'm going to share a little testimony in a, in a second, but this has been a very hard, difficult message to prepare for. Because just know the best sermons that I ever choose to let God, me surrendered and him do through me, are the ones that I look in the mirror and they step on my very toes and that I struggle with. So I want you to know, and I'm going to share in a little bit, I am not here to preach to you. I'm here to preach to myself and let the Holy Spirit work on all of our hearts. If you if you join me in that and let God do something through us. We're going to be in Matthew 18, and I'm about to pray for us, but Jesus is going to start our message today saying, hey, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over, but if they won't listen, take one or two others. Uh, may every matter be established by two or three witnesses, and if they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. Uh, just gather the elders is basically gather a church body that can surround the situation. And if they refuse to listen to the church, treat them as a pagan or tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, which means a releasing of a prisoner. Okay, that will come in handy in a bit. Um, and then he says, I tell you that if two of you agree about anything that you ask for, I love this. We sometimes quote, where two or three are gathered, God will be there with them. Did you know the context of that verse is that when he sees us gathering with one person that we have some, an issue with, he's like, I am there. God, his number one place he wants to be present is when his people forgive each other like he forgives us. He's like, I am there, whatever you need. If you don't have the words to say, if you don't know how you're going to start that conversation, there I will be with them. Isn't that comforting? That it, really difficult conversations that if the Holy Spirit is calling you in this message to have this week, God's not going to leave you alone. He's going with you in that conversation. So as you hear this lesson today, we're about to pray, but who am I currently harboring hate and bitterness in my heart towards? Who have I been the most unwilling to forgive and reconcile with? I want you to think about that person. Think about them through the lens of how Jesus views that person, and let's pray together. Father, it already feels like a heavy start for me to start this message. It's, it's not very light. It's, it's a burden. There have been people that have absolutely shattered our hearts and maybe we've done nothing to them and it's all been done to us. And God, whether we are, whatever role we have in it, God, whether we've been hurt or we've hurt others or whatever the situation is, God, we need you to reign. We need you to be present. We need you to guide this situation because I can't forgive them on my own. I'm gonna need your strength. And God, if my brothers and sisters today, if they would open their hearts, if I would open my heart, who is it that I've been unwilling to forgive. Let this message, let their heart, let their face be at the forefront of my heart as we enter your word today. In Christ's name, we all prayed. Amen. So guys, I, start, I said I'm going to start by telling on myself. Um, when I was dating Brittany back in, you know, 2005, uh, before some of my friends were born in this room, 2005, I started dating this incredible woman, and she became my wife, but, you know, there's only one issue that we seem to have, and she noticed the way I would treat my dad. And quick pause in the story, my, my parents are going to be here in two weeks, and a great end to the story is that I have a great relationship with my dad today, and he is a part of my children's life, and it is, it is all praise to God, but in this moment, I never thought there would be healing or reconciliation. There were things from my childhood that, I, that were a trauma for me in different ways. And uh, my, my girlfriend at the time, she would say, you treat your dad pretty poorly. And I was like, oh, 
you ready for me to tell you everything he's ever done to me or my family? Get ready because then you're going to be on my side about this. And she goes, I hear you, but are those things still happening? Uh, is your dad still doing those things? No. Uh, when, uh, okay, yeah, he asked for forgiveness. He worked through the reconciliation steps. He even went to the church and went through those steps to confess and repent. And, and I wasn't listening to any of that. I go, but Brittany, I'm hurt. My, my siblings are hurt. And she goes, but has your dad, is, is your dad, I don't see that version of the dad you're talking about. Is that true anymore? And I was like, and the Holy Spirit kept working on my heart. And I realized there, I want you to hear this today. Change is possible. If someone has been absolutely your enemy and broken your heart and shattered everything about your life, did you know Saul was a persecutor and a blasphemer and a killer of Christians? And there's a guy named Paul the Apostle that wrote half of the New Testament we read today. And if we don't believe that God can completely transform someone from evil to christ follower, then what are we doing here? If we don't think transformation is possible, then we don't believe in the gospel. Amen? My dad was changed. I saw a Saul to Paul transformation, and I didn't see it until the Holy Spirit worked through my wife, and that's the reason I married her, because she is obedient to Jesus Christ. If you are looking to be married one day and you're single, find someone who is obedient to Jesus before your, your will and the culture's will. Man, that changed my life. And I have, a, I have a grandpa for my kids now, and I'm thankful. I told you guys, this is hard, and there's people in my life that I still haven't reconciled with. And so I want you, if you're struggling with this topic already, if I'm stepping on any traumas you're going through right now with people, just, just know I'm going to start with what is forgiveness and what is it not. Let's start with what it's not. Number one, it's not an excuse for sin, God has to pay for all sins, all evil. He is a God of justice, and justice will happen over that situation, whether Jesus' blood covers it or one day they'll have to stand before God. It's not an excuse for sin, nor is it denying the hurt you've been through. And God wants you to honestly bring your pain to him. He's not saying, sorry, I'm about to resurrect Lazarus. Get over it, sisters who are crying. He sits there and weeps with us. What hurts our heart, Christ is crying with us. You're not alone. And remember, forgiveness is not a feeling. It's not something that one day you're like, I feel like forgetting, forgiving. It's a, it's a decision every single time. It's an intentional, conscious decision. Number four, it's not forgetting what's been done to you. Christ does not have this, I used to watch Men in Black growing up and they had this little flash thing they could make, 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 make someone's memory go away. I don't know if anybody has seen that with me, I'm a nerd. But uh, we, we do not have the ability to wipe away memories. Those memories are there probably until you meet Jesus in heaven. They'll be there and, that, and God's not asking you to forget what's been done to you. But he is asking us to work through trust. Trust has to be earned, forgiveness is a gift. So you can forgive someone, but demand boundaries for your life and have that trust be rebuilt over time like it was for me and my dad. That, that God allows room for that. And the second is, I gotta tell you, refusing to forgive is rebelling against God. At the end of the day, God commands us to do it, but I want you to hear as we go throughout this message, if you are a person currently going through pain and trauma, God is not asking you to get over it. He's asking you to, what can you do between your heart and soul and me? If you hear nothing else, really this lesson is about your heart and your walk with Jesus more than it is changing what people need to do to make things right. Who do we have control over? Ourselves. I can't make someone go through the reconciliation steps, but I can do what Jesus talked about, which is this conversation. Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how many times do I need to forgive my brother or sister? Um, who sinned against me? Is it up to seven times? And he says, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Or another translation, 70 times seven. So, it's, so is it 490? Is it 77? Let's keep going. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with a servant. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. 
Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that they had to be sold to repay that debt. At this, the servant fell on their knees and said, be patient with me and begged, I'll pay back everything. Let's go through this. Number one, why did Peter say seven times? Well, in this culture, rabbis taught their students to, you can forgive someone three times. That's as gracious as we're going to get. If they sin against you a fourth time, goodbye. So Peter was like, oh, I'm a follower of Jesus, and I know he's really, he's, he's the best teacher around, so how about this? How about I double the amount of normal forgiveness, Jesus, and then I add one on top? And he was really impressed with himself. He goes, you just don't understand. My bar of forgiveness is not like any human it is not, it's beyond your imagination, and he's going to sh- go as far as to show us what that level and capacity the king has. But first, he was like, I just want you to understand that the king in my kingdom, I have a forgiveness capacity that you can't, you cannot fathom. So let's look at this. How many talents did he own? Depending on your translation, I think it said 10,000 right? 10,000 bags of gold or talent. So it's a weight of gold. Let me help translate this for our modern day U.S. dollar. Okay. It would take you for one talent or one bag of gold on that. It would take you 20 years of your life to earn just one of those bags. In an average lifetime, we would earn three talents. So this guy had 10,000 talents of debt against him, which would mean 30 3,333 lifetimes. Let me translate that even more. From Adam in the garden all the way to Jesus, did you know that there were 76 lifetimes between Adam and up to this moment this was taught? So are you guys tracking this calculation? They had only ever experienced 76 lifetimes, and they heard Jesus say, this guy I'm telling you about in this parable owes that times of whatever that calculation is, 3,300 lifetimes. And just to let you know, this king in this hyperbole, this exaggerated parable, would never get back one one thousandth of the amount of debt that was incurred against him. And then it was cute of this guy to say, hey, I'll repay it. Look at that. Just be patient with me. I'll pay back 3,300 lifetimes of my salary that I owe you. Does that sound crazy? Well, This is the God we serve. He's going to now teach us that we forgive because you had a debt against you. This is the application he's starting to point us to. Look what he says. The servant's master took pity on him. He canceled that 3,300 years of debt against him. But when that servant went out, this is the crazy part of the story, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me. This fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I'll pay it back. Okay, this one more time is a hyperbole. It's an exaggerated parable. No one can pay back 3,300 years of salary. But then this guy shows up and says, thanks for forgiving me 3,300 years of salary but this guy over here owes me three months of salary. And I'm not going to forgive him. In fact, I'll choke him until, and I'll, I'll imprison him. So a hundred silver coins was a hundred days of a common worker's wages. It was a small sum compared to what unimaginable grace he was just given. Um, in fact, this guy put him in prison And someone in prison in these days could not pay their way out of prison unless somebody came to release them. So he basically did not even give him an opportunity to to try to pay back three months of debt when he had just experienced 3,300 lifetimes. Let me say it like this. Romans 3.23 says, and if you know it, for all have fallen short of the glory of God. All of our sin. Romans 6.23 says, do you know what the wages of your debt is? It's not 3,300 lifetimes of salary, it is death. This is what we are owed. Let me, let me illustrate it like this. So, I gathered a few things from the Bible. You can find certain sections of sin in the Bible. So let, let me ask you, myself and you today. Have you ever been in your life guilty of sexual impurity? What about greed? 
What about moral corruption? Or how about murderous hate in your heart? Have you ever had unguarded anger? Okay, so how many lifetimes, how many talents, how many bags of gold is that against you? Well, what about this? Have you ever been guilty of foolish behavior? A heartless lack of love? Have you ever not offered mercy? Have you ever kept a record of wrongs against someone? Have you ever been guilty of unwholesome talk? Have you ever been self-seeking? Have you ever had impure thoughts? Colossians 2, 13 through 14 says, when you were dead, the wages of my sin is death. Even just one of those. When you were dead in your sin, God made you alive in Christ Jesus. You know how he did this? He forgave the 3,300 lifetimes of your sin. He canceled your legal indebtedness that stood against you and condemned you. And you know what he did to it? There's this thing called nails that went through his hand because of me. And he he asked you a question today. Do you, as a follower of Christ, want to hold all of your sin, or would you rather all this weight against you, the legal indebtedness that you will be owed, which is the wages of your sin is death, do you want it in your hands, or do you want it here? He said, you have two choices. It can be on you, or it can be on me. But let's talk about this. I'm willing to do this. He is so willing to do this. But then there's a, there is a stipulation. He only has one stipulation for forgiving the 3,300 lifetimes of your sin. What does it say? It says he refused, this servant, who wouldn't forgive his friend of this three month of sin. The master, excuse me, The master called the servant in, you wicked servant. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you, Mike, have that same level of mercy that I just had on you? In fact, you offering that same level of mercy is already light years away from each other. Remember the 3,300 lifetimes versus three months? Just forgive someone for three months. Shouldn't you have a a minuscule amount of grace in your heart. And and then he said, you know what? I am angry and I'm gonna send you over to be tortured. You just threw that person in prison. I'm throwing you in that prison. You're gonna hold your sin and debt once again that I just forgave until what? You're willing to offer the same forgiveness that I just gave you. Grace received has to be, not can be, has to be extended. There's no option for Christ's followers. You either have 3,000 lifetimes of sin upon you or you forgive three months of debt. So it's like this. So we have all this against us that Christ is abundantly willing to take from you that you don't have to hold. But you know what? My three months of salary I'm holding against someone is because one time Mike, you don't even know that somebody gossiped about me, and they, you don't know what they said about me, and it's caused others to view me that way. Someone lied about me, Mike. My reputation is ruined, and you could go on and on, and I could hear you, and I need to hear that myself. Jesus feels our pain, but let me ask us this, this process. What happens if I'm unwilling to forgive three months' salary that somebody committed against me? Let's go through this. If you would, follow closely. What happens if I don't forgive? The first thing is this. This one should be every ear listening. Matthew 6, 14 through 15, right after the Lord's Prayer, right after you say, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, give me my daily bread, forgive my trespasses that I've trespassed against you. Okay, God's like, I can do that. I sent Jesus for that. Listen to this. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will take your debt. 
But if you are unwilling to forgive people that small amount of debt compared to what you had against me, I will not forgive your sins. Do you guys see this? We're not, we're not, we don't have a works-based gospel. This is not do enough and be enough so that you're saved. It's receive forgiveness from Jesus and that same level of grace that's been given to you, you better be walking clothed in grace because if you remember these little things against you, just remember what you had against you. Every time you remember this, I want you to go compare it and, it, and you can keep saying, Mike, I can't get rid of it. I know sin is sticky. You keep saying, give me my daily bread. Give me my daily bread. I want my sins forgiven. I don't even know how I'm going to forgive that person. But I'm laying it at your cross. I don't know how I can let that go. But I'm going to work towards that because I want my debt forgiven of myself. Think about it like this. If you gave your enemy a cup of poison, but then unforgiveness is like drinking the poison and expecting the person to die. You are drinking the poison when, Hebrews 12, you allow a bitter root to grow in you that brings defilement. Another reason is, what if we don't forgive? How about this? Did you know that someone might have offended you and they might not have even known it and you replay it in your mind and you're actually punishing yourself every day? By not going to the person, they might not even know they hurt you. And you're just letting it replay in your mind. What you don't forgive, you will be cursed to relive. So let's say it like this. So what you're saying, Mike, is I need to find something in me to work through this gossip. But Mike, what you're not realizing is this. You're just saying somebody gossiped and lied but you don't know the trauma that I've been through and what they've done repeatedly and I've done nothing and there's a weight on me that you don't, you can't comprehend. I hear you, your sermon's great, but you're, you're minimizing what's been done by showing these little offenses. Remember the beginning of the lesson. There's no excuse for sin and it will be dealt with. Whether it's dealt with on earth, between you and that person, or one day the God of justice sin cannot be in his kingdom. All will face the judgment seat. The question for people on earth is will you let Jesus take your sin here or will it be dealt with before the God of all justice that all sins will be reported to him? Whether good or bad, it will all be, but but guys, I get to walk to the cross because of Jesus and I don't have to carry that. I don't have to, what does Romans 12 say? It says, do not take revenge on people let those burning coals heap on their head because God's going to deal with that revenge. He, you don't have to. He is going to deal with it. If you're a song person, listen to this, write this one down. Matthew West, forgiveness. It will clear the bitterness away. It can even set a prisoner free. There's no end to what the power can do, so let it go and be amazed by what you see through eyes of grace The prisoner that it really frees is you. I know some sins done against you are unimaginable unimaginable, and you don't see a single way that you could ever let it go. But he still says, no matter if it's gossip against you or a level of trauma that has affected you the rest of your life, you trust it all to the cross have made myself a prisoner by sitting in that unforgiveness. He says, I want you to bring every one of those things to me. So as we close, here is where I guess the rubber meets the road. I'm going to help us out. If you are not sure how you're, you know that Jesus is willing to take that, for, take that from you, your sin and their sin, but here's what I want you to do. If you are not Email deb at office at esunshine.org because these things are going to be incredibly helpful to you this week. I don't know how I'm going to forgive people. I don't even know how I did it outside of my wife in the spirit years ago for my dad, but it's possible. 
Reconciliation and forgiveness is possible. Here's what you can do this week. Ask yourself, am I in conflict with someone? Here's what you ask yourself. Has someone sinned against me? Have I sinned against someone? Has someone broke my trust in them? Have I spoke poorly about anyone? Am I actively avoiding anyone? Am I imagining payback, revenge, or justice? Remember, you don't want justice to happen to that person. As much as they've hurt you, you don't want ultimate justice to happen for them. The number one thing you should do right now is not be hoping justice rains down from God on them. You should be on your knees saying, God, I want them in heaven. I want even my enemy in heaven. Jesus stretched out on a cross. He said, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Maybe the Holy Spirit hasn't captured their heart. Maybe they don't know Jesus. You don't want that person in hell. You want them in eternity forgiven by Jesus. So ask yourself, can I overlook this? Proverbs says, a person's wisdom yields patience. It's to one's glory if you start to overlook an offense. So can you privately overlook the offense? Can you make any allowance in your heart for their fault and forgive them? If not, here's when to not overlook an offense. Does the offense dishonor God? Has it broken a relationship? And does the offense hurt others? This point, what this one is about, is some things you can brush off your shoulders. If you're thinking about it two days later and then you don't think about it on the third day, maybe overlook this one. But if you've thought about it for weeks and months, you have to move to the next step. What is my part to own in this situation? Matthew 7 says, I, I know you see the plank in their eye, but you have a bigger plank. You, you think there's like a, there's a speck in your eye, you don't even see it. There's a big plank in your eye and it's called the unwillingness to forgive. So ask yourself, do you realize that blame rarely is on 100% of one party? Do you think you are 100% guilty of what's happening between you and that person? What are your actions, however big or small, that have contributed to the conflict? So I'm gonna give you very practical steps. Here it is. Number one, humbly you take the lead and say, I wanna tell you what I did wrong. You don't even focus on what they did wrong. Start with you. What did I do wrong? And don't justify it, just say it. And then I want you to do this. Say, I'm sorry. Like, say those words. I am sorry to you, and here is why I'm sorry, and be specific. The third is I want you to ask for forgiveness. Ask them, will you forgive me? Say that out loud. The fourth is to accept the consequences of whatever that looks like. So for my dad, he had to rebuild trust. Sometimes when you work through reconciliation, you have to be willing to work through the consequences because you ultimately want them in heaven, and you want to the best of your ability to rebuild Remember what, uh, Paul, uh, what Paul said in Romans, as far as it depends on me, I'm going to live at peace with everyone. Can you control what they, how they react? No. But as far as it depends on me, I'm going to be a person of peace. And the final thing is, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit, restore that person gently. What I want you to do is gently bef- start with your plank in your eye, but then address the speck in their eye and tell them in love you've offended me, and here's, here's how you've hurt me. Or actually, let me even say this. Don't say the word you. This is how that made me feel. This is how I am doing. Don't point the finger. Just say, I felt hurt when this happened. Talk to them one-on-one. I've botched this one multiple times when I've said it in front of other people. You will botch it. You will never have reconciliation if you don't start one-on-one with someone. And if that doesn't work, bring some trusted friends. If that doesn't work, bring some trusted elders or ministers. But if at any point they show any humility and they ask, I'm sorry, you forgive them and it's not, I'm going to go back to this the next time you hurt me. You wash it as clean as the sin you committed. As far as from the east to the west, your sin, Jesus doesn't even see those things. If you are a believer and you're willing to offer mercy, he doesn't see all my sins, he sees Christ's righteousness through the blood of Christ. I am such a sinner. The wages of my sin are due death, and I'm still a sinner, but by the blood of Christ, I'm redeemed, and the only thing I can do to thank God, my act of gratitude is willingness to work through reconciliation. 
mercy and grace that was given to me. Bear with each other and forgive one another if someone has a grievance against you. Forgive, what does this say? Help me with me. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. By this, all people will know you're my disciples for your love for one another. So my last questions to you, I'm gonna ask all of you to stand for this song. I'm gonna ask that the elder couples surround the auditorium. I have struggled deeply with forgiving people and I want you to trust the situation. Find one of our six elder couples around the auditorium. Find some ministers or someone you love. Will you pray with someone during this song and say, I don't know how I'm gonna forgive this person but I would love for you to pray for me to do that. And I would also say, if you've not accepted the perfect, freely given gift of grace, Jesus taking your sins on the cross, you can become a Christ follower today. Grace received is grace extended. Guys, let's sing together. Go pray with the leader today if you're struggling with this. We love you. Have a great Sunday. Let's sing. As we close here today, I'll be reading again from uh, the book called The Jesus Calling. It was a... A daily devotional that came out many years ago and is written from the perspective as if Jesus was talking to each one of you. So as I read this, imagine Jesus is speaking to you. Don't worry about tomorrow. This is not a suggestion, but a command. I divide time into days and nights so that you will have manageable portions of life to handle. My grace is sufficient for you, but its sufficiency is only one day at a time. When you worry about the future, you heap day upon day of troubles onto your flimsy frame. You stagger under the heavy load, which I never intended for you to carry. Throw off this oppressive burden with one quick thrust of trust. Anxious thoughts meander around about and crisscross in your brain, but trusting me brings you directly into my presence. Enjoy my presence continually by trusting me in all times. With these words of encouragement, I encourage everyone to venture out into the world embracing our roles as God's children. Thank you. Have a great day.